So, hey guys, my name is Karthik Palella. I'm a second year, sorry, third year computer science and engineering major at UCLA. And I'm also the president of the Brin Spacecraft Group um, here at UCLA. Um, so here is the attendance code for the event, um, per Aspera at Astra for the people who are gonna be here for now. Uh, I can give you guys like about 30 minutes, sorry, 30 seconds to note it down. Um, yeah, it's per aspera at Astra, which means through hardship to the stars, which is a motto that we hold dear at Burn Space. Yeah. So as I said, my name is Karthik. I'm a third year computer science and engineering major here at UCLA. I'm also the president of the Brin Spacecraft Group. One in a bunch of interesting, interesting facts about me, I learned to learn new scripts. Uh, for example, I can read Arabic, I can read Cyrillic, like Russian, maybe a bit of Greek and whatever, but I have no clue what they're saying. So I can be like, it says Marhaba something, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, I have no idea what that said. Um, although I read like Russian and some movies and it says supermarket and something, I'm like, hey, I know that. Um, does anybody here like science fiction, like science fiction movies, stories, and whatever? Ooh, there's a response. Okay. Yeah, so I absolutely love science fiction. I read a lot of books, uh, magazines, uh, watch a lot of short films about science fiction. And I love to talk about The Expanse, which is an amazing show that I love. Uh, yeah, and if you have any questions for me during the rest of this presentation, um, definitely put a message in the chat and I'll look at it and I'll try to answer to the best I can. So what is the Bruin Spacecraft Group at UCLA? We lose things in Army bases, not once, but twice. So we launched like a high altitude balloon a while ago and it kind of went up and it went up and up and up and it popped about there, fell down uh, in the middle of an army base where they were testing, I think like tank ammunition or something. So it was pretty like dangerous stuff. But while that was a fun trip, we, that's just one of the things we do uh, at Bruin Space. Um, more specifically, we work on space mission design and development at UCLA. What that involves is usually building high altitude balloons, like the one we lost, uh, building CubeSats, which is the topic of our presentation today, experimental payloads that can go either on the CubeSats or balloons or, or in other places. And on top of that, we also conduct workshops for people who are interested in, in, in topics in space. Uh, you can check us out at the following link. Um, I'm not sure if it's, yeah, it's linked. It's the it's our website. You can it has all the information about us on there. Oh, this is a picture from um, our lab, which is on eighth floor Bolter Hall. So it's basically the terrace. This is specifically from the winter because uh, the sun sets early and it's very very beautiful. I highly encourage everybody to just come come upstairs, come check us out. Um, of course, when the lockdown ends. Ooh, there's a question. Uh, and we'll, we'll be really excited to see you guys up there. We can talk to each other about space topics or even science fiction movies or, or anything that you want. Uh, this is one of the CubeSats that we made uh, and it's in the lab, which is again on the F4 Builder Hall. So this is a quick agenda of what I'm going to be talking about today. Uh, I'm going to start with, you know, how, why do we need a CubeSat and kind of where they came from and what even is a CubeSat in the first place? Because uh, we need to, you know, set that in stone. And then we go on to the different applications of how we can use such a piece of technology um, from, from new startup ideas to, to like industry stuff that they've been doing for ages. Um, how do we kind of convert you know, ideas and a CubeSat thing. Uh, and then we look at research and development. We kind of look at how, uh, what potential research looks like for, for CubeSats and, and how we can uh, 
build new things in the future and on what kind of ideas can be expanded upon. And finally, why should we care? So I'm gonna assume here that most people here are computer science or computer science and engineering majors. So why do we care, right? Because traditionally space seems like a airspace or, or like a non-CS thing. Um, so I'm gonna kind of try to convince you here if you're not convinced at that point why you should kind of look at this phenomenon. So first is what are we looking at? Like what's a CubeSat? What's, what's, what am I talking about? Uh, so before we had CubeSats, there were a bunch of issues, right? Because um, space is hard. Uh, it's hard to get to uh, and, and very few people had access to it. So far, the only actors in space have been government agencies like NASA, mm -hmm. the Canadian National Space Agency, the Chinese uh, government, the European government, Indian government, and so on. It's, it's, it's very hard. And the reasons for that is, um, first, non-standardization. Uh, first, Pico satellites. So if you go back to, let's say, your, some of your math classes or science classes and scientific notation, Pico is like a very, very small unit, unit of measurement like 10 to the negative 12. So it's a, it's, it's a very small number. So, and, and what Pico satellite means is a very tiny satellite about the size of your phone or, or even your arm. Um, and they were non-standardized. So people kind of made stuff in different shapes. Like one is a hexagon, one is a circle. And they're like, you got to design a shape from the beginning over and over for every new mission. High costs was a major factor because a lot of the stuff that went on board a mission was, was like cutting edge stuff. Like you have missions like the Hubble Space Telescope, which was, they worked on it for years and years and the telescope itself was very costly because the, the labor put into it, the cutting edge kind of parts that to use. Um, and and it, it just went into a couple of billions of dollars. And, and if your university if, or, or a small company you cannot really afford a couple of billion dollars uh, just off the top of your pocket. Maybe the U.S. government does, but not us. And also, the development time was just too long for a lot of missions, like the Hubble Space Telescope took years. The James Webb Telescope is taking up like more than a decade. Uh, the reason you know development times can take so long is because uh, once you put a mission in space, it's really hard to replicate that mission a second time because you're strapped for money and you want to try out other new missions. For example, you might want to send the thing to Venus, but you cannot do it again because you just don't have the funds. You want to do something different this time, like go to Mars instead. So whatever you send to Venus has to be in shape. It has to be perfect so that once it gets there, it has to work, not fail. So for that, you have like long times of testing and testing and more testing. In the design phases, you got to design it so that it's it doesn't, it works. So on, and, and then... Uh, and, and it creates some of the most amazing pieces of technology, but it, it, it's just really hard to make that. So combined with cost and the time, it's just really low accessibility for the average Joe to like, you know, have a space mission. You can't simply say I have a backyard space mission that I made just the other day because I had coronavirus downtime, right? Um, so, and also not enough frequent launches. Uh, sometimes launch windows for certain missions were too, were too small or even the uh, launch windows for really massive satellites. There were very few rockets that probably could send massive satellites to space. Sometimes you needed massive satellites because you wanted, um, you kind of packed years and years of research and technology into one CubeSat so that you would think even flies in the first place. So all these issues together kind of made it really hard for universities, small companies to kind of break into you know, testing in space or experimenting and so on. So, this brings us to uh, the 1999 paper or proposal for CubeSats. Uh, it, it was a joint uh, thing between um, Dartmouth, Stanford, uh, San Luis Obispo, and so on, uh, where they kind of propose how we can you know, solve these issues mentioned here. Uh, so as a prelude, uh, as time went on, electronics kind of decreased in size and, 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 and also increased in complexity. For example, the common joke is our iPhones contain more power um, and more computing power on them than the entire Apollo missions, which, uh, which is incredible from a technological uh, point of view. And this picture is a picture of 
one of the uh, earliest IBM computers that took up an entire neighborhood block. And if you want to send a computer to space that does complex things like take a picture of Mars and just, is that a dust storm or is that um, like something else? And you needed computers and they were massive and you had limited memory, limited power consumption and so on. So you had to like build around that. Versus if you have something the size of your smartphone, you just don't, you don't have to worry about space. You can always use like a power bank, onboard power bank to like get information, uh, get power. Um, and also that additional space can be used for other instruments. And lower launch costs, you know, over 50 years, if you keep launching rockets over and over and over again, at some point you become an expert and you kind of find ways to reduce the cost. And so, or, so that's kind of what happened is, you know, relatively the prices kind of went down. So this is a quote directly from the research paper, like an opportunity acceleration with small, so accelerating opportunities, you know, for, for people with small, low, constru low construction costs, low cost, low launch cost, low launch costs, space experiment platforms. Now I wanna, I wanna highlight space experiment platforms because that is a good portion of the work trying to being done in space. The International Space Station right now in space um, what do those astronauts do? Like, have you ever wondered? What they've been doing is basically we send experiments from the Earth, from different research groups, university professors, scientists to space, and then they kind of spend their time just conducting those experiments as given by directions from those ground based groups, and they kind of do stuff there. Um, but of course, you got to launch, you got to bag a spot on one of those official launches to the ISS. Versus if we can make your own satellite and send to space, it's kind of easier. So this brings us to the year 1994, uh, to the Space System Development Laboratory at Stanford. So a group at Stanford. Uh, what they wanted to do was essentially, they wanted a project for students that, and a hands-on project, keep that in mind, where students can work on creating up, coming up with their own project, so project inception, working on this on the project uh mission design mission planning um all the way until launch and then do, and then you know practicing the mission operation cycle and then deorbiting and all that so that by the time they graduate they're ready for the industry with their own you know small mission under their belt now i want to go over the kind of ideal requirements for their program that they kind of listed the first is student management uh, because they wanted students to gain experience in how to manage such a project and the, what are the um, uphill battles or downhill battles that they have to kind of look at when you kind of manage a project of such scope. Student design is important because, you know, design and inception, you want to uh, make sure the students kind of know which parts to add where, why they do it, and, and why not to do something else. Now, design to launch within one year. So this is a critical part because... Um, uh, most of these students, let's say you're, you're an undergrad, you, you're here for four years. You cannot really work on a mission that takes eight years because at that point you're going to graduate, you're going to go work in the industry and you're not going to care about your mission any, anymore. So they wanted something that students can build within one year, something they can, you know, care about. Costs less than 10K. This is important as uh, this price is feasible for university funding and funding from other external sources or in sponsorship. Because most missions were like a couple billion dollars or a couple million dollars, something that let's say UCLA does not have the money to give just to any random club, right? So they needed something that is cheap to make. And one way to do it is off-the-shelf components. So off-the-shelf components are useful as they're generally cheaper, but at the same time, they're replaceable. So if let's say one component fails and you know that it didn't work, then you can replace that with another component of a different design or, or maybe just buy a second version of the same thing. For example, one common off-the-shelf component that we use are Arduinos or even Raspberry Pis because they're just $35 and you can just buy one and keep buying more and more as you need. Um, and that also helps with cost, which is great. Mission duration of one year so that they can kind of get data from the mission and kind of analyze that and see what's happening with it. Now, the combined mission is gonna be about two years long. So this is enough for you to come in as a freshman. And by the time you're a junior or halfway through your junior year or your third year, you have an entire mission under your belt. Um, and you can be like, hey, uh, I have a space thing in space or a space mission in space. And that's gonna sound super cool to people. So 
that is what they wanted. This resulted in the Sapphire and Opal satellites. So this guy right here um, is the Sapphire satellite. So this guy um, was a result of kind of this philosophy of trying to build something small. Of course, like certain, some of these constraints are like not too hard. Like it doesn't have to be within one year, but approximately one and a half is fine. Um, this launch, this was the first student built uh, Pico satellite to be launched to space sometime in 2001. Uh, and this is Opal, which is their second uh, Pico satellite. So the difference between this guy and this guy is Opal, uh, I'm not sure if you can see clearly, but these, these are like small slots, uh, which are smaller kind of boxes or kind of stuff slotted in them that are experiments from other research groups. So what Opal does is it gets launched into space, put into orbit around the Earth, and then as a spring inside, they kind of just deploys them, like kicks it out of the set and be like, hey, you're on your own. And then it does whatever experiments on it were, were planned or designed by the other group. And, and, and yeah, so this is like a massive deployer to other mini satellites. So the whole point is uh, they kind of realized that, hey, this framework can be replicated for other universities and other small companies for, to, to build more affordable space access. Which brings us to the CubeSat. So the Sapphire team worked alongside Cal Poly San Luis Obispo to design a deployer where they can, you know, collect satellites or mini satellites from different groups. Uh, maybe one group has a one experiment, another group has a different experiment that they want to test out. And then they can just kind of put it together on a single deployer, go to space and the deployer deploys it in space. Um, so this is uh, one of the prototypes that they made. Uh, notice the fact that this is that there are string, uh, springs in it. The spring just literally just shoots it out into space. Uh, these are placeholder cubes. You kind of slot them in there, and then you send this whole thing to space like a single package, and then you release those modules once you're up there. So this uh, the cube factor was kind of desired because it's 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 a standard thing to design. It's kind of easy to make. Um, of course, standardization kind of helps with, the, with reusing the same deployer over and over. Um, solar panel coverage on this would be really great, uh, according to the paper. Um, and one interesting thing that uh, one interesting insight that I saw was that it puts a focus on the payload, not the satellite, which is important because by having a cube uh, form factor, you can constantly churn out the same design over and over. You can just refer back to the same older cube design instead of designing the entire structure from scratch and instead focus on integrating um, a payload or an experiment or anything to the CubeSat instead. Uh, any questions on the history part so far or I can move on? Um, are we taking questions? Yeah. All right. So um, this is what a CubeSat looks like. It's, it's not nothing to worry about. It's, it's just a 10 by 10 by 10 centimeter cube structure. It's a cube as defined by the CubeSat docs, essentially. Uh, so what goes in a CubeSat, right? So these are the different subsystems that go into making a CubeSat. Uh, let's look at the first one, electrical. This basically powers the electrical systems on board because you need to like have a battery that kind of powers the computer. Solar panels that kind of provide you additional battery power uh, and help a lot. Structural, so structural is important as this designs uh, the, the, the chassis uh, or even the materials with which you make a CubeSat. For example, choosing a cube form factor is a structural decision and, and the sizes of that is also structural, mechanical. Um, materials, for example, some materials could be 3D printed uh, some of them could be metallic. Uh, for example, the structural design for the Sputnik satellite was a, a ball of metal with antenna sticking out. Software, so this is uh, where you guys might find some interesting parts because it, uh, it's ACM. Uh, flight software is important as it controls the, the instruments on board. You can look at the how much battery power is left how, whether the solar panels are working properly, whether you're sending stuff to the ground, 
you, you kind of get information from the different onboard instruments. You can kind of package it into packets and you send them to the ground through the comms system, which is what we're going to talk about next. Comms is important as you want to, you know, talk to the satellite. You want to, like you send it up into space, but now what, right? You can't simply not talk to it because what's the point of sending it up there? Uh, so we have an antenna on board at ground stations that can receive that information and talk to it. Propulsion, um, not all missions necessarily have a propulsion system built into them, but for those who do, they're usually used for either increasing the orbit of the satellite or um, decreasing the orbit so that they may burn up in the atmosphere towards the end of the mission. Some thrusters uh, could involve like um, hull thrusters, ion thrusters, or even like standard um, fire-based chemical thrusters. Uh, so it's pretty interesting. And attitude. So this is not a CubeSat with emotions, but more of a CubeSat with orientation control. So uh, stuff like onboard gimbals and then gyroscopes that kind of tell you which way the CubeSat is pointing, why it is pointing that way, and how can we you know, put it in a different direction. Uh, let's say you, you want to point the CubeSat towards USC to see what they're up to. This is the guy to do it. Payloads is another important factor. So payloads are, are like the passenger, the, the cargo on board. So this is often um, like an experiment provided by another university group or a computer or a, a really high-end computer that you want to test to see whether it works in space or maybe even mice in some cases, or I don't know, that could be a mission. So the payload is that kind of stuff. Yeah, so this is an explosion of the interior of a CubeSat. So this kind of gives you just how dense a CubeSat can be within the cube. For example, um, electromagnet, electromagnets, electron cannons. So electron cannons are like the propulsion systems. Solar sensors deal with the electricity. This guy deals with the orientation. So on and so forth. I mean, comms is this guy. It's pretty, uh, yeah. So now software for space. What does coding for space involve? What does it look like? It's so primarily um, coding for space has been um, focused on low level base coding. So for example, C, C++ and stuff, uh, if you've taken CS111, and you really, really love that class, I think you're going to love um, this kind of stuff as well. Uh, Beagle Bones. I think we use the Beagle Bone for one of our missions as well. So, yeah, that's something. Uh, and then onboard memory is important because lots of times in space, um, we some of the computers were, were really hard on memory. We even used SD cards to increase the memory onboard caching system. But... Uh, but yeah, that's, that's some considerations that people take when you code for space systems. Um, data budgets uh, relates to um, packet processing. So this is like when you want to send, when you combine all the data together from onboard instrumentation or health data, telemetry data, and you want to send it to the ground, you're limited by the bandwidth that is provided by the antenna. So you got to look at the data budgets, like how much data you can send. Um, oh, and also like other languages, um, are gaining in popularity, mostly because we've had more and more computer science majors getting involved in the space industry, and especially as Silicon Valley is taking more interest in the space industry, because a lot of these Silicon Valley guys wanted to be astronauts probably before they wanted to be coders. Um, so languages like Rust or Python are some of what we used before uh, to code. Onboard instruments are something you control and subsystem data communications uh, and commanding the spacecraft because you don't want to send the wrong commands and put it in a spin towards Mars or something. Ground software, so stuff like mission control where you have the data coming in, but you want to make sure that the data is understandable for human consumption um, and also commanding. You don't want to send the wrong commands. And recently we have uh, seen a pro proliferation of onboard machine learning or AI especially as this, this field of research has, has grown in popularity over the past decade. And as always, new startups, new ideas um, for software. And, and I can't wait to see what you guys come up with for, for CubeSats for Space. So let's establish some common terminologies. Uh, so we begin with defining like the sizes. So we have a 1U, 2U, and NU CubeSat, or 1 unit, 2 unit, and NU. 
So this guy right here is a one unit CubeSat, which is, it's literally just one CubeSat. This is a two unit CubeSat, two CubeSats stacked on top of each other. So can anyone take a guess for what size this is? Maybe? Is it a two and a half? Or I mean, there could be a two and a half, but usually you want to go in one iterations. So this is a three U CubeSat. And you can also have six U, which is just two of these put next to each other, and that's six units and so on. Launch provider uh, is nothing but a fancy way of saying a rocket. Uh, but I say launch provider here because not all deployments of satellites in space have been rocket based. The space shuttles, for example, uh, are famous examples of um, you know, a way to launch satellites into space. Uh, companies like Virgin Galactic are working towards um, having planes or, or space planes that kind of go and kind of release your satellites in space. Uh, CubeSat deployers, uh, this is similar to the Opal satellite that I mentioned. We send a huge CubeSat bus that has smaller CubeSats in it, and once it's in space, it just releases those CubeSats in a predefined trajectory um, or just releases them so the CubeSats can correct themselves. Payload, as I mentioned, is the onboard cargoes. Uh, for example, if, if you're in a plane and you're, pl and you're traveling in a plane, you're the payload on that plane. Um, and payload is, of course, relative to what it is in. For example, uh, the rocket payload could be a satellite, a CubeSat. A CubeSat payload could be the experiment on board, and so on and so forth. Now, I'm going to give um, uh, so some, some highlighting to the technology readiness level, which is nothing but the immaturity of a certain technology. So this concept is important uh, as I talk about prototyping later on. Uh, maturity of technology is, is, is a piece of technology is not mature when let's say I, I come up with an idea for a new smartphone but at that point it's untested it's just in my ideas and it's just immature yet uh, not mature yet versus I have created that phone I've consumer tested it seen certain issues built upon it improved it and at that point it is ready that the technology readiness level is pretty high so this concept is important and keep it in mind as you think about um, the ways in which CubeSats are being used by different entities. Uh, this is a picture of um, a CubeSat deployer aboard the International Space Station. Uh, this uh, is basically deploying to CubeSats in space. That's like a massive solar panel. Uh, yeah. So here's a quick video of how what one of the ways in which you can deploy CubeSat. So let me just play that. The birthday of Konstantin Sholkovsky, the father of Russian astronautics. That uh, satellite deployment came at 10.15 a.m. Central Time. Yeah, we're trying. The second of these two Tanusha satellites uh, coming up shortly by Rosansky. They just hit our fingers and that's what sends them spinning. Are you ready to adjust? We are. Go. Nope. And there goes the second Tanusha satellite at 10.16 a.m. Central Time. Did you guys see that? He just threw it. So three right. out of the Chucked five the uh, satellites ship. have been space deployed ship. now. The other two coming up. Uh, the first time I saw this, I thought it was completely hilarious. So I just want to share with you guys that this is actually one way to send CubeSat, CubeSats into space. Oh, uh, is that a question? Okay. Um, so today, what, what, is, uh, what do CubeSats look like? Um, there have been more than 800 CubeSats launched in space already since 1999. Um, and in 2017, there was a record uh, number of CubeSats launched in a single launch. Um, keep, uh, if you notice that 96 of them were American out of 104, which is most of them were American. Um, 80, 88 of them were by the same company. I'll go over this guy later on. So there is a marked American dominance in the market. Of course, Americans invented it, so it, it kind of makes sense. And it, it, it was invented just north of UCLA. So um, there has been an increase in the commercial usage of CubeSats, which kind of makes sense. They're cheaper to make than before. And, and there's lots of advantage to using CubeSats for certain applications. So of course, people kind of bank on it. 
and UCLA. So it's really popular with universities and with organizations like the Bruin Spacecraft Group because it is affordable. It is within our range, and we can definitely ask uh, for funding not just from universities but from other companies for sponsorships um, and other ways so that we can make such you know satellites and and we also have the expertise to make such uh, CubeSats. Um, and of course, there's a relevant XKCD for this. So this graph here shows the number of CubeSats being launched uh, per launch vehicle. And as you can see, the number has been increasing as rockets keep taking more and more CubeSats into space. Um, more numbers. So. This picture right here, or this graph right here, shows the exponential increase in the number of CubeSats over time being launched. Uh, this number is kind of low. Initially, it kind of goes down because we haven't really, because uh, enough data has not been added yet. As time goes by and people add more and more data to the database about their CubeSats, we can expect this number to go higher. Uh, but we can clearly see the increasing popularity of CubeSats. And here we see kind of who is sending those. So if you notice the, the prominence of green, that is universities, which kind of makes sense, as they're the ones who see the benefit of you know, a CubeSat technology because they're cheaper to make, uh, they're quick to make, and, and students uh, can, can definitely make it within their lifetime kind of thing. The other trend you notice is the increase in commercialization. So it's calm as commercial, and we see like, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, recently with the increase in commercial launches. And uh, the military, of course, is a, is a player. This graph just shows the um, average orbit, um, the distance from the surface of each orbit. So it's about like 500 kilometers from the surface of the Earth. So you can see this kind of average thing. This graph, uh, shows the kind of CubeSats being launched. So the most popular, of course, is 1U because they're smaller and easier to make and then easier to pack. And then it's easy to like experiment for a lot of universities. And this kind of graph says the same thing. This graph, show, these, uh, this data shows uh, which countries launch uh, CubeSats. So, well, I do wanna say that they're, gonna, they're missing China from here, but China is a pretty prominent launch provider, the United States, Japan, and the European Union uh, make their own CubeSats and then they launch them. Uh, no, uh, you can ask questions uh, in the chat. I'll try to see if I can answer them as I go on, but uh, asking them after also kind of helps. Um, so we can see the United States, of course, launches its own CubeSats, so does the European Union and Japan. The interesting thing is India and Russia kind of launch CubeSats from all, all over the place, uh, including China. And they use the proceeds from these launches, like when you want to launch, you're going to pay the launch provider some money. They use this money towards funding their own um, satellite, their, their own space programs. This graph kind of shows you the dominance of the United States on the market, and second is Russia. And they also have the ISS because of the onboard deployer. So I want to give a certain uh, nod to rockets that kind of put our stuff in space. Uh, this, it is something that I call rockets as a service. As I mentioned, you kind of saw India and Russia kind of sending rockets of other, other countries or other corporations into space. So uh, the miniaturization of CubeSats, the ease of access has enabled like lots of other countries as well, who traditionally don't have their own space agencies or cannot go to space to kind of make their own CubeSats like, you know, the most prominent university in that country kind of has a CubeSat um, mission. Lots of new companies have, or have arisen to kind of meet the demand of increasing CubeSats. Uh, the Long March uh, rocket, uh, rocket here, or the, the, the SpaceX uh, Falcon 9 rocket, here you can see landing on the Earth again, or the Electron uh, rocket by the Rocket Lab Company, a joint Kiwi American venture. Uh, Many of them are, are even building new rockets dedicated to solely launching only CubeSats. For example, um, the Russians and Indians are, are trying to make a rocket that is specifically for CubeSat launches so that, so that they can fund their programs more. So this is just something I wanted to share.
Oh, and this is a picture of what it might look like. Uh, so we have the main, so let's say you have a rocket mission um, and it has a massive satellite in it, um, like a main mission. And then you, you kind of notice this small space in there and that's where they shove all the other additional CubeSats. Uh, for example, Dubai Sat or, or Cube Bug, um, Pakistan's iCube, Spain, and other countries that don't traditionally have, they don't make CubeSats or have space missions. So it kind of gives access to them. So we move on to the next section of industry use cases. Um, so we kind of see how this piece of technology is being used and applied in the industry and how the different actors have found interesting ways of applying them. So we uh, have the different kind of applications, like for example, space sciences, uh, which is one of the most obvious reasons uh, or the most um, traditional applications for, for uh, satellites in space, uh, for deep space exploration and uh, observation. Earth observations, uh, this is something that we've done since the beginning of keep of satellites uh pointing towards the earth and seeing what what data we can pick from it uh communications so for example a good portion of our communications is is through satellites especially with companies like dish tv or satellite phones position navigation and timing uh the gps is possible only because of satellites and and many countries have launched their own gps's and so how can CubeSats kind of augment such uh, a field? And, and that's one application. Space situational awareness, kind of looking at whether we can mitigate uh, spacecraft collisions in space, keep space safe, kind of like a green thing, like keep space green or keep space black, you know, I guess. Um, rapid prototyping is also important. This is one of the main reasons why CubeSats were invented because since they're easier to make now, what can we, test out in space. Uh, so we move on to the first uh, category. So this is the traditional use of a CubeSat, space sciences, um, commonly used by universities for their science missions and also by, traditional, by the traditional space agencies for cutting edge scientific research and understanding. Uh, our first mission is Asteria which um, is an ex ex excellent example of NASA's love for abbreviations um, of, so in this case is the arc second space telescope enabling research in astrophysics, which is hysteria for short. It is a technology demonstration to conduct astrophysical measurements. Um, and here you can see it being launched aboard the ISS, kind of just going on its freeway. Uh, it is the first successful JPL built CubeSat successful because there probably were uh, previous and unsuccessful satellites or something. Um, JPL, for those who don't know, is, is based, is, is a NASA uh, um, office based in Pasadena, which is close by to LA. It's about like a one hour drive. Um, so the purpose of this mission was to conduct, um, to see whether you can have precision telescope measurements using a CubeSat. Uh, so in, in, in kind of fancy lingo, arc second level line of sight pointing error. Basically pointing without, min, without error. A highly stable focal plane, so like stability and the temperature controlled in, in, in space. Like can you control the temperature of things in space? Uh, the status of the mission so far is they have been able to, you know, take pictures of Earth-based stuff, um, pictures of the comet, uh, of the asteroid belt uh, like Vesta, comets, Uranus, um, and other stars that might host planets, like staring at a star long enough to see whether it has a planet or not. Um, and this is the camera that went on board. Uh, you, and then you had universities like MIT that kind of worked on it, or the Burn Institute. And of course they had a paper that kind of documented the results of what they learned from the mission, like certain things that went wrong, certain things that went right, what they can learn from it. And of course, the scientific kind of output. Mars Cube One is the other, uh, is another interesting mission. So as a background, uh, sometime in 2019, I think about June, NASA launched the Mars InSight mission, 
which uh, unlike the rovers on Mars is, is, is more of like a, it just goes to the Martian surface, stays at a specific spot, drills into the Martian earth and then or the Martian surface kind of looks for signs of water, signs of life and so on. And in addition to the launch, they, they kind of sent two CubeSats. The purpose of these CubeSats was during the descent of the InSight um, payload, uh, they would provide near, near real-time communication because um, the, the descender or the descent module was on the other side of Mars outside of, outside of the direct line of communication with Earth. So the relay kind of, it's, as it says, it's a relay, communication relay that provided near real time of about 12 minutes delay between Earth and Mars, a light delay. Um, so yeah, terminology, it's a 6U CubeSat. So basically six kind of cubes put together kind of made it that size. Um, something I found interesting is they named the two CubeSats after characters in the movie WALL-E. One of them was named WALL-E, the other one was named Eve. And they kind of flew together uh, until they kind of lost contact. Um, this is a picture of Mars from on board one of the CubeSats. And even though it may seem like it's just a picture of a ball floating around in space, they did learn a lot from this mission just by this picture because they, they apparently got information over the atmosphere on Mars, the weather at the time, and something. And that's the uh, mission logo. I found it cool. Uh, oh yeah, so if you can see the mission logo, that's the CubeSat, and that's like the data that's being sent. So, and that's the lander, the parachute, sending data to the CubeSat, and that's sending it back to the Earth. This is a picture of the CubeSat on the Earth. That's what it looks like. Um, can you imagine that something this tiny actually went to another planet? So this was the first ever interplanetary CubeSat mission, and, and I found it just mind-blowing that things this tiny could go all the way to another planet and actually talk back to Earth. So I do want to give a shout out to Project Elfin, um, a student-based research group that sent the first uh, satellite from UCLA a while ago. And this is one of the perfect examples of what the CubeSat proposal attempted to achieve. Uh, a student group uh, where you had students come in, work on a project where they could gain experience and, and, and actually see their project go to space. Um, it did take a long time, uh, but they did learn a lot from the Elfin mission. Um, this is enabled due to the lower barrier of entry. Uh, so the mission essentially was to uh, take data to, to look at the uh, space weather, uh, so like loss of relativistic electrons in the radiation belt. They sent two satellites in space, both of which, which are currently um, you know, collecting data um, on, about this mission. Um, yeah. And then this finally brings us to Blue Dawn, which is Moon Spacecraft Group's very own first CubeSat at that. Um, yeah, and, the first and so the point of the mission was to explore the effectiveness of the Magneto Hydrodynamic Pump. Uh, we call it MSD pump for short, since that's just easier to pronounce. Uh, so what this is, is essentially, um, so normally pipes on earth, so let's say you flush your toilet or you kind of wash your hands on, in a tap, or you have pipes that kind of send fluids from place A to place B, right? Um, these pipes usually have lots of moving parts, like a turbine or, 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 or something else, or, or screws put together. Moving parts usually also means lots of areas, uh, areas that can go wrong, that can kind of break apart. In space, you don't want that because this in the ISS, for example, there's people's lives online. So you want to like reduce the, the areas of error. So for that, we came up, uh, it's an old idea, but we try to come up with a MHD pump experiment that can be prototyped in space. What this was, it was essentially, um, we had a, like a hydrodynamic fluid uh, or like salt water in our case that we put in here and then we passed uh, electromagnetic fields to them, uh, usually a magnet and then electro, like a coil that kind of increase the magnetic thing, to the magnetic fields passing through the fluid and that induced the fluid to move around inside. 
this is a flow meter that kind of calculated whether it was flowing or not. So this experiment has uh, potential implications for uh, our tech demonstration mission for new applications in life support systems. So this uh, is gonna make the engineer's life easier in space knowing the fact that um, you have a much safer system that is protecting astronauts' lives when they flush the toilet. It sounds kind of weird, but these are the kind of considerations that you might wanna keep in mind when you build stuff from Mars or, or even for, for interstellar missions that are currently in the realm of science fiction. Um, the current status is it did fly on the Blue Origins New Shepard rocket. It's this guy right here. Uh, it is a 2U uh, satellite, so this guy. Um, you can see the logo and that yellow thing was the um, pipe. Uh, this is the New Shepard rocket kind of landing back on the Earth. It, it's it's uh, reusable. And so we go on to the next uh, category or next set of applications, which is Earth observation. Earth observation or Earth pointing satellites have been used since the beginning of you know satellites. Of course, in the beginning, this was to usually to spy on a different nation on seeing what they're up to. Uh, that it, um, and today, this usually involves um, stuff like Google Earth, where we kind of look at each other's homes and be like, hey, I live there, or oh, that's my garden, or that's my gazebo, and so on. Um, and also satellite navigation, in some cases, be like, hey, we're, we're in the middle of the desert that flew in an army base kind of thing. Uh, this picture in the background I just want to share with you guys is a picture taken by Commander Scott Kelly aboard the ISS. This guy right here is Los Angeles. That's the Bay Area where I'm from. It's, this is California, the Central Valley. UCLA is, uh, I think, about here. Uh, and we, uh, yeah. So that's where, that's where we're from, or that's where we go to school at least. The first company we, we're gonna look at is Planet Labs. So their mission is to miss the entire planet daily. And the reason for this is by taking a picture of the same place over and over and over again every day, or maybe a couple of hours, you can notice certain trends um, and, and see, you know, based on the changes being taken. For example, uh, I'm sure a lot of you have heard about the, the clear uh, canals of Venice, right? The, the, uh, the Planet Labs CubeSats can, can show you how, how the canals of Venice have changed over time from being murky to being crystal clear. I don't have their pictures because of course I got to pay for them, but just imagine this is changing to be more clear. So that is, so those are some trends that they, that they can pinpoint. Um, so I was going to initially going to say that it was the largest satellite constellation, but I just researched more and I figured out that they're no longer the largest satellite constellation. SpaceX has taken that mantle for Starlink. Um, so they do have 300 plus satellites in space that cover a lot of area on earth. Uh, this uh, is a picture of them being deployed. And if you notice here, these are stacks and stacks of their satellites ready to be launched. And the reason they're able to have, you know, so many of them is because CubeSats are cheaper to make than before, um, than, than previous satellites in space that were usually the size of buses. Uh, <clears throat> and what they contain on board is high power telescope and cameras, of course. And these are some of the use cases for which you would use, you know, earth pointing satellites like crop yields. This would help farmers and in, in, in places like uh, rural India uh, or, 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 or crop growers uh, throughout, you know, Central Valley in California. Urban planning, you know, planning cities, disaster, disaster response, you know, seeing where which roads have been broken due to the earthquake and so on. And I will also want to mention that a lot of these companies kind of work on the subscription model that has been po become popular in the CS kind of field where you kind of subscribe or you got to pay Planet Labs to gain access to the data they take or for the latest data. Which brings us to the next guy, uh, next next company, uh, Black Sky. So I do want to uh, say that Black Sky has a bit more focus on military missions. So let's just keep that in mind. So they also also provide space-based monitoring, like that's probably an oil tanker kind of, it's definitely not shady. Uh, so first to know intelligence and analytics. Uh, for a lot of military kind of intelligence guys, they want to know firsthand like what's happening, what's the latest update on, on, on something happening somewhere. 
um, for example, tracking coronavirus, you want to know which places have been affected, where, where that they have been affected, where people are moving about. Australian fires, you want to get the latest data on where the fires are sp spreading so that people are safe. Stuff like that. And, and one interesting thing that I found is that you can design your own mission specific constellation suite, which basically means they kind of build your CubeSats, uh, from, they kind of consult with you on building your CubeSats for a specific mission kind of parameter. Um, and, and they kind of provide you kind of ground operations, uh, analysis of the data, or even like integrate artificial intelligence and in cloud computing so that you can see what's happening. For example, you can just sit anywhere, let's say you're sitting in Boulder Hall, just in C's Cafe or something, and you wanna just log in and see what's the latest update on, on what's happening somewhere uh, or where the fires are. You just log into your portal on your phone and you can see what's happening. Um, so basically like a cloud-based eye in the space. Uh, one interesting thing, thing, thing uh, concept that I found was this concept of virtual constellation. It's kind of like what we do in CS for like virtual, virtual machines where we abstract out like a hardware layer. But here, you kind of, they abstract out the, the picture taking. So let's say you're on earth and you want to, uh, you know, see what's happening specifically around a volcanic eruption, right? And you say, hey, Black Sky, can you uh, give, me that, give me analysis on that eruption there? So what these guys do is they handle, the, the constellation handles, you know, pinpointing that information or the satellites in that direction, while the ground client just looks at, just knows for, just trusts in the fact that there's a back end out there somewhere that kind of reliably sends pictures to the front end. Um, and the front end kind of shows packages that data to the user uh, so that they can understand what's happening on the ground and they can act on it. Spire is another interesting company in terms of um, uh, monitoring. So again, the same thing, space to cloud data analytics. Uh, so far they have more than 80 satellites in space. They were the second biggest constellation but of course, they're now become the third because SpaceX has taken the mantle as being the first. Um, so they were the first commercial satellites to be deployed in the ISS. Uh, this is what their satellites look like. I, like the, you can see they have wings and then additional solar panels to, to get more energy. Uh, these guys focus more specifically on weather data and predictions, so providing close to real time, you know, weather data seeing where because if you're a ship in the middle of the pacific ocean you do not want to be stuck in a you know like a massive thunderstorm so you kind of talk to these guys and you see hey what's the weather like where, where, I'm, where i'm at maritime is also one place uh one important you know customer for for such data for example this here is um a picture of the shipping in the persian gulf uh, and you can see how the different lanes from the different countries, the different ports, um, or you can see the concentration of ships around here. This is the Strait of Hormuz between Iran, Oman, and the UAE. And you can clearly see that there's a cluster of ships there. And so what, what can we kind of see from here? Um, rapid, okay, uh, rapid iteration is something that they kind of try to boast, uh, where they update the hardware and software every two or three years. Uh, how would they update the hardware by kind of deorbiting a single satellite um, so that the older hardware kind of just gets burnt up and they launch a new one in its place? Software updates by just saying, hey, here's a software update, and you kind of update one and then you can update the rest and through you know distributed computing. Uh, it is possible as CubeSats uh, are smaller and cheaper because. Um, it is possible to like replace a CubeSat because it doesn't cost as much as before. Um, and another interesting tidbit is they, these guys also started their company or their initial funding on Kickstarter. So, uh, so which is why they, they have only 80 compared to 300 for Planet Labs, but now that they're a bigger company, who knows what they're gonna do. Oh, this is, um, a concept for what they may look like in space. Notice the fact, notice that they're looking down at the ground towards the earth. Communications. So this um, communications has always been one of the primary focuses of satellites in space from, from, from broadband to, to 
uh, satellite TV to satellite phones. So if you're stuck in the Amazon and you don't have internet connection, you would usually, you know, pull up your satellite phone and talk to the rescue guys saying, hey guys, I'm stuck here, can you help me out? So uh, one thing to keep in mind as I, as I talk about, you know, both these, this kind of cluster-based space is if you're taking distributed systems, this is, this kind of uses concepts of distributed systems where you have many computers on board the, the, the constellations they're going to talk to each other to try to communicate with each other communications and trying to send information to the ground you kind know, of connecting two and two people from opposite sides of the planet um, so the first thing uh, we talk about is spacex starlink so uh they provide a satellite-based internet access so the reason they do it is uh there's a lot of places on earth that do not have internet connection. So as I mentioned, one example is the Amazon. The other example is the, the North Pole, or if you're in, a, you're, in a, you're in an expedition to the South Pole in Antarctica, and you want to connect to the internet to see um, whether, where you are, like, uh, then, then you need internet for that kind of stuff. So there's lots of areas, like rural areas that don't have, that don't have internet. And, and putting CubeSats in space that provide internet is a way to democratize you know, internet access uh, so that it's not, it's, it's not controlled by a single government or a single entity. Uh, of course, low cost global broadband, connect undeserved regions of the earth. These are pretty small, as you can see, this is Elon Musk for scale. Uh, and this is like, I think 60 uh, Starlink satellites in, in, in one launch per launch. 422 so far, and they keep planning on launching. They keep launching and launching more and more. There's going to be thousands at some point, uh, they projected. Um, this is right before they kind of get released in space. Of course, having so many satellites in space is a cause for concern. There is an increase of risk of space debris. Uh, as you have more satellites in space, there's, there's a bigger concern for, for collision with each other. Um, there's an impact in astronomy because lots of ground-based telescopes, they kind of depend on long-term exposures. And in one of those exposures, if you just see a streak of light, just going across, and that's just gonna ru ruin your, your view. Um, and oh, autonomous collision avoidance is something you wanna have on board to like reduce space debris. So this is one of the examples of what this looks like from Earth. So notice the train is pretty bright as opposed to other stars in the, in the night sky. So this is somewhere in Germany, and even with all of this lighting, if they could take a picture, then it must it must tell you something about how why there's a lot of cause for concern. And um, can anybody uh, can anybody see the uh, cubesats in this picture? Let's pause the cubesat. So. Uh, what we have here is a train of CubeSats. So I'm gonna trace my mouse around so you can hopefully see these. So these are Starlink CubeSats that were taken from aboard the, uh, a picture taken aboard the ISS. Uh, it's a very beautiful picture. And it, can, it also tells you the range of uh, these CubeSat clusters that can be achieved. So let's say you are a guy here and uh, the CubeSat over there initially just starts then this moves on, you lose connection, the next one comes on board and you can lose connection and so on. So you have like a long, longer range of connection to the internet and to the services of such a cluster-based CubeSat structure. And this is possible because CubeSats can be manufactured in bulk because they're cheaper and so on and so on. The other company is OneWeb. So these guys, of course, uh, is uh, their their goal again is high speed low latency global connectivity who doesn't want that right uh currently they're they're in the process of launching satellites um that's a good point so starlink uh, is not necessarily a cubesat because they're not built to the cubesat form factor but i really want to but i did want to mention that as an introduction to this concept of uh, communications using CubeSats. 
Thank you, Da Chang, for that question. Uh, but the uh, the R are, are constellation in space, and and it is like uh, and they are small and miniaturized. So Starlink is one example of how miniaturization and the same the philosophy of CubeSats has helped towards making internet more democratic. So for one web, uh, their goal is to have a seamless video call from the North Pole. So all you got to do is you have your local client, which is usually a router that you connect to. The router connects to the satellites in space. Um, like you send a request here, they connect to ground-based gateways, which are ground stations and huge dishes that kind of receive your data and connect to the internet. The internet processes, processes your request and sends it all the way back to you to talk and, and so on and so forth. Um, so this is one example. So notice the white dots, they're kind of hard to see. So those are the satellites in space. Um, and the red areas are the possible ground stations. So as you pass over those, sat let's say you're here in the middle of the ocean, you wanna to talk to UCLA. So you would connect to one of these guys, they would connect to the nearest ground station, they would connect to the internet and that would connect to you in UCLA. So here's a quick video on how this might look like, not just for one web, but for other companies as well. So at about the one minute mark. And then to the next approaching satellite. So you can notice as that satellite goes off, another one connects and that region is in constant kind of communication. So that is kind of how uh, it kind of works. The next company is Sky and Space Global. So these guys are a bit different from the last two examples that I've seen in that they don't provide internet access, but they provide voice and texting for people. Um, and they have tested this uh, by sending a text over this service uh, in one of their test missions. So these are three unit CubeSats. All of this picture appears to be 6U. So this is from their website, so I don't know. Um, and as before, autonomous optimal network management, which is a fancy way of saying um, connecting to the network and, and connecting to each other so that they can kind of pass, you know, connection requests with each other. Or onboard orbit control, so kind of knowing when they're degrading in orbit or when their mission is over uh, or when something breaks, when to the orbit. Interest at that linkages, so you know certain rudimentary concepts that are common in distributed computing. Uh, so, okay. So before we move on, for example, how I want to give a small story on how um, space-based communications are really useful. Uh, one one of the people I I was talking to over over the past couple of months, right after the coronavirus lockdown was a student from India who went to college in India, who, because of the lockdowns, could not go to university anymore. He didn't really have a laptop, no internet access, and he lived in some remote village in the middle of, the, in the middle of India with no internet access uh, because it just didn't go to the, come to, the, to that village yet. So that is a perfect, and, and it didn't help that uh, most, most of the classes were being conducted over Zoom and he need internet for Zoom. So this is the kind of stuff that kind of helps him out. Um, not just even in India, but even here um, in America, in, in, in Antarctica, in, in Africa, South America, America, and so on, where it provides internet access to those who need it, uh, where they normally would not get, because it's just for everybody. So this, uh, I put this video here so that you can see how a CubeSat is made. I'm gonna put this at two times the speed. So it's pretty dense usually because you have such a small, because you have such a small um, you know, form factor and you wanna you know, package a lot of information, a lot of experiments into it. Uh, you can see them attach these solar panels here. And uh, yeah, that's what this looks like. There's probably antennas. Now on to rapid prototyping. So this uh, is kind of like agile. 
uh, this is the closest to analog I could get because you have things like sprints where you can uh, work on a small piece of advancement for let's say a two week period. You can fix that and you can see whether there's issues with it or issues not with it. And then you can move on to the next stage or the next step in building the same technology. Again, we call the technology readiness level that I kind of mentioned a while ago. Uh, prototyping helps towards increasing the TRLs of, of various missions and various gadgets that kind of fly on these missions. DDO2 is a satellite uh, sent into space uh, that for the pharmaceutical industry. So as a, as a background, stuff works differently in space. Why? Because there's no gravity and uh, there's also no, um, there's lots of radiation up there, black matter and other stuff that is just different and, and hostile to, to humans up there. So for example, this picture uh, is a great example. This is water initially, it was water and dyed water. Um, and because of no gravity in space, the water collapses on itself, creating a perfectly stable spherical shape versus on earth, it's gonna go downhill, it's gonna fall towards the ground and be like all liquidy and stuff. I mean, it's a liquid. <laughs> Um, so pharmaceuticals is an, is, an, is a perfect area of research in space because chemicals work differently when, when you kind of merge them in space. Um, I'm not an expert on it, obviously, as you, as you can probably see by my hesitation. Um, I'm a CS guy, not a chemical guy. I did really bad in AP Chem, just saying. Um, so the company that built DDL2 is Space Pharma. As the name implies, it's a pharmaceutical company. They already built two pharmaceutical labs that were sent to the International Space Station um, that the astronauts have have kind of tested in space. What astronauts do is essentially they kind of get experiments from the Earth, put them in the ISS, and they follow the guidelines provided by the Earth-based researchers and do it in space instead. Um, this specific mission was to make a CubeSat or miniaturized end-to-end -end pharmaceutical laboratory under microgravity. Um, and being a CubeSat, it's free orbit and it's not on the ISS. Status, they learn new things. Um, closed system, completely autonomous. Since you cannot have humans kinda, in space that can add water consistently, so it has to be self-sustained. This is a screenshot from their website. Hopefully this explains better um, of what they did, of what the mission ha did for all the chemical and pharmaceutical majors out there. This probably makes a lot more sense to you guys. The one thing that I did understand from this thing was this specific thing, um, where they tried, where I think they tried mixing oil and water together. So normally oil and water don't mix well, they kind of separate, they coalesce separately. In space, they found it, they found that it was kind of slower so minimal drop coalescence occurred compared to immediate phase separation on earth so stuff was different and they were able to find this out because they they were able to make a cube set send it into space conduct that experiment and there are two more stuff enzymatic reactions where they oxidized glucose and then saw what happened and then they tried adding water to a peptide and and seeing what kind of structures it resulted in in space, apparently it was spherical versus sheaves on Earth. I don't know what sheaves are, but they found something fascinatingly new in space. And this is one of the perfect examples for rapid prototyping. Light sail is one, is one of my favorite missions. As, um, as a fan of science fiction, the concept of solar sails have been you know, put forth for a very long time, uh, both by Arthur C. Clarke to Star Wars. So what light sails essentially are is you have a light source that kind of release photons or, or something, light. And then you have a membrane or like a sail that gets pushed because of that. It's similar to like, um, you know, sailing ships on earth where you have a wind that pushes the sails and then kind of pushes the entire ship forward, but for space. Um, I have Bill nice picture here because he was heavily involved with the project and, and funding and he evangelized it. Um, and of course, Bill Nye, the science guy. So, did, so it's Light Sail 2 and not 1 because they did launch two of them. The first one was um, 
in the previous decade, in two thousands, that kind of didn't work. It just didn't deploy. The second one deployed, and it was a mission success. Uh, how they found a measurable change in orbit, and uh, now it's just scheduled to burn up in the atmosphere. And I personally think the the mission patch for the light sail mission is super cool. You can see the light and then the the sail. Uh, this is uh, what it looks like. This is the um, the unfurled um, sail. Some examples of solar sails in science fiction are the solar sailor from the Avatar movie, uh, where this is in Pandora. And this is Count Dooku's solar sail, the solar sail that he uses to escape Geonosis at the end of you know, Attack of the Clones. Small tidbits. And this is what a concept of what the mission might, might have looked like in space, where you have the light coming in and pushing on this solar sailor and, and providing just free of charge um, propulsion. You don't have to have, it's not dependent on fuel, but on the constant light source. Sorry, okay. This is a picture from the mission that was sent to the gr uh, ground. This is another picture over California. Now, OPSAT is, an, uh, is the European Union's or the European Space Agency's first CubeSat. Now, this is a bit different uh, in that it is very computer science focused. Uh, so they did send a computer that was 10 times more powerful than previous missions. Um, and you can read the de description of the computer there. So this computer right here developed by the, uh, the um, the Technical University of Graz in Austria. In Austria. So the reason for this is they wanted a test bed in space directly where they can test out you know, algorithms that are specific to space missions and, and testing out new innovative solutions for, for previous approaches, um, specifically like new protocols, uh, new algorithms that might work differently in space, techniques, um, and then of course you don't want you don't want to. You want to make sure that whatever you create does not fail in space, because um, failure protection is important. Because let's say you, you the 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 pharmaceutical mission kind of failed halfway through in space. It's it's just irritating. Um, I mean, of course, irritation shouldn't be a major <laughs> concern. And it and such a um, mission allows you to upload and try new innovative control software. So for example, you, uh, one of the provisions of the mission is that you're able to completely uh, change, uh, replace the flight software on board um, or the onboard operating system and then, and then see how that might affect the mission. They also have some onboard instruments to kind of see how that might work along with the, uh, the, the software and see how the software, a different kind of software on the same instrument, how does that break or make the mission? Uh, they also tried this concept of apps, but for space. So just like how we have apps for our phones, can we kind of create like a closed app ecosystem where anybody can make their own their, their own um, um, maybe software-based experiment and then deploy it on the satellite? Let, let's say we have um, a company that wants to, to 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 take pictures of a certain body of a specific body in space, and and they want to do it in a certain way, get certain specific kind of data. So they s deploy their code on board this guy, point it towards there and see whether it worked or not. Once they're done with their part, then we can always kind of delete that application. Another group comes on board, they test out their stuff. Um, yeah, and I highly encourage you guys to, to check this mission out later. This is the perfect example of a flying laboratory and uh, for prototyping new kinds of missions. Space chain. Uh, so this is the first ever um, blockchain-based satellite cluster uh, constellation. And it's open source, or I think, so they do have access to the GitHub, so you can check it out later. So why do we want a space-based blockchain, right? So what's a blockchain? Um, at the very basic level, blockchains are are, are a way to, to save data permanently and without... Uh, tamper without tampering so you kind of tamper resistant because you can detect them 
there's some consensus protocols and all that. Um, and it is a secure way of, of also saving data out of reach of, let's say, internet kill switches. Let's say the country doesn't like what something's happening in their country and they don't want other people to know. So they usually cut off their internet by, but by putting, you know, by having blockchain, you can store that information there and it stays there forever. And also government oversight is, is another factor. And putting CubeSats in space, no government has access to them because they're in space. And they keep moving constantly over many nations. Uh, one of the you know, goals is to be able to run decentralized applications or dApps in space on the space chain OS operating system. Um, recently, they've been trying to integrate Ethereum, uh, the Ethereum blockchain and smart contracts and other, and other smart contract based software onto um, their, their constellation. One interesting thing is they also have tested a transaction and there's probably more transactions that they've tested out. And uh, it's overall a really fascinating use of traditionally computer science fields, but integrating it with space. So this is a perfect example of how kind of Silicon Valley and, and the airspace kind of come together. The final part is research and development. Like what kind of, possible research can we do for CubeSats and, and what kind of questions might they answer? What kind of questions can we possibly answer with the CubeSat? Uh, before we move forward, I, I just want to share this, this, uh, this, co this quote by Carl Sagan. Uh, Somewhere something incredible is waiting to be known. Basically, this, this, this idea of, of curiosity, right? Where, where uh, there's always like even though I have given some examples of possible applications, there's definitely something that you can come up with that has never been taught taught before. Taught before. So these are some examples. Um, so CubeSats, of course, are, are really new. They have picked up in, in popularity over the last decade, uh, especially as as um, um, as computing has has become easier cloud computing has has definitely got uh keeps that software to our homes as we saw for companies like black sky spacex providing internet services and monitoring services to the ground that we can manage from our phone and connecting to the internet um and there's still people coming up with interesting ways right as we saw with the blockchain example I, before researching for this presentation i did not know that we can or i couldn't even come up with the idea of having a blockchain that is based in space. Um, another science fiction example is the show or the, or the books Altered Carbon, where people kind of have data backups on satellites in space. And that's something that could be a possible area of research. Like, can we have a satellite-based data center, right? And that is CubeSat, that CubeSat managed so that um, if one goes down, the data doesn't get lost because because of the distributed systems based architecture. Uh, of course, I mentioned space based blockchain mining, um, interplanetary missions with with solar sailors. It, it provides you a constant source of acceleration, um, and 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 maybe we can point them towards other planetary bodies and be like, hey, go to the moon. There have been examples of using solar sails to go to other planets, like the Japanese Akatsuki mission. Uh, and, and I forget the name of the solar sailor, which did go to Venus. And can we do the same thing with the CubeSat? And then the further question is, can a student group or a small company replicate this um, um, as time goes on? Because what if we have private companies that kind of send their own CubeSats to other planets, maybe for asteroid prospecting or, or kind of figuring out what resources are, are available on the southern pole of the moon? Um, Distributed systems in space as a computer science guy and a guy taking distributed systems currently, this is absolutely fascinating to see how we can use and how we can um, increase the computational power of computers in space. Traditionally, distributed systems on Earth and, and the cloud have enabled computations previously limit, limited by a single computer to, to have the capabilities of the entire network, right? Concurrency um, and, and, and consensus. Um, acting and all of that. So 
how do we do this for space? For example, what if we send a CubeSat cluster to, I don't know, Neptunian orbit, right? And, and you have a, a single CubeSat cannot compute much. You, get, you take a picture, okay, fine, you send it to the Earth. But, you know, talking to Earth from Neptune takes about 20 hours for, the, for you know, communication to reach here. And, by, and within 20 hours, a lot can happen. So you, want, you usually want to have on-site on you know, computational power. Can you do this using you know, the CubeSat cluster? Because you have so many CubeSats, they have onboard computers. Can you combine them together to, to like analyze the same picture on site instead of sending it all the way back to Earth? I was analyzing it and sending, them, sending commands again, which takes about at least 40 hours, right? Um, so, so there is like one hypothetical you know, way we can use CubeSats or area of research that is being thought of. Uh, intelligent CubeSats from clusters, like maybe onboard AI. So that is where the idea actually stemmed from. Like I was thinking about, um, can we have, you know, CubeSats that are intelligent, you know, that work as a hive mind and how can that work? And then are they gonna have enough computing power on board to even run a machine learning, you know, algorithm on them, which kind of went to, wait, does this thing already exist in distributed systems and so on and so forth. Um, and then internet on Mars. So this is a question that has been posed by many, many science fiction stories, by many research papers. Tim Berners-Lee, the founder of the internet, uh, is I think currently working on an internet protocol, but for space, so like IPv4, IPv6, but imagine IPv space. Um, and how can CubeSats leverage that and, and the current you know, ecosystem, like we have the, the SpaceX Starlink or, 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 or OneWeb that already have internet services, how can we use those to, have internet on on Mars. Uh, for example, we have imagine you are the first settler on Mars, and you look up and you see this train of of, of satellites in space that are connected to the internet all the way on Earth. So you can just take a picture of 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 the canyon you're in and post on Instagram saying, "Hey, I'm in a canyon," or or you know watch movies, you know, have Netflix all the way on Mars, even though the lag is going to be horrendous. Um, or even The Expanse, um, the show kind of has one possible uh, solution of how the internet infrastructure can be built for space. And then CubeSat-based asteroid prospecting, of course, this is another example where we can have, we could slap a solar sail on a CubeSat, say, hey, go to that, you know, asteroid. Once you're there, you kind of like, you know, close these sails again, point the camera towards an, each, an asteroid and be like, hey, does this have water on it? Does this have helium-3 on it or, or whatever? So all of this is, is just um, a small set of examples of, of, uh, of how we can use uh, CubeSats, of, of questions that are currently being asked by the community, by research groups, by companies, by, by startups. Like, hey, can we make money off this? Or, hey, can is this even possible in the first place? Uh, this is a picture of, of a ship that is being tracked by, I think, the Black Sky or Spire. Um, um, and then they, they use machine learning to detect the fact that, yes, this is a ship. And this is the direction it's going in. And, and another possible, you know, um, excuse me. Another possible um, application is space-based telescopes. Um, currently, we have telescopes that are uh, in Earth orbit, um, and they're usually limited by uh, the atmosphere. Or we have, uh, or there's only so much, so big a telescope we can make on Earth to launch on a single rocket. But what if you make like a cluster of CubeSats that kind of each of them has a camera, but if you put together put them all together, they can create the most powerful telescope ever known, even powerful enough to take pictures of planets in another solar system, right? So that's a question being thrown around. So that's, if that isn't exciting, I don't know what is. Seeing another planet on another solar system. Finally, why should we care? Why did I care about this? Um, if, you, if you haven't been convinced already to, to kind of love, fall in love with CubeSats and their applications, well, certain trends show us a boom in the industry. For example, we see you know more CubeSats uh, 
the space economy. So the numbers, of course, are increasing a couple of millions of dollars. It is projected to be at least a one trillion dollar economy by the end of the 2020s decade. Uh, with companies from Silicon Valley kind of pouring money essentially into companies like Space Explore, or Inspire, and other rocket companies like um, like Rocket Labs and so on. Um, and it's called the New Space Movement, where it's kind of like a Silicon Valley kind of restructuring of the space industry. We have seen CubeSats uh, are one of the perfect examples. Even university students have access to space, so they can, you know, come up with new ways to access space in house as a university project. One story that I like to tell people is um, just look at computers, right? Initially, computers were invented by the British government by Alan Turing to, to break the Enigma code of the Germans. And over time, like they were expensive to make and, and you needed to have the resources to make a computer, which is why the government had the first computers. But over time, companies like Microsoft, Apple, kind of brought miniaturized computers brought them to our homes and now we have computers the size of our phone they can fit in our pockets smaller than the Apollo space program so the same thing the same trend is happening for the space industry is before this was dominated by major space agencies and not not just any space agencies but countries that um, have enough resources to spare on extra things like space like the United States Russia European Union versus countries like versus the African Union do not have enough resources yet to have a space you know, agency in the first place. Um, and CubeSats are the perfect gateway because they're cheap to make, universities can make them. One example is the Astrophy in Initiative. So this is an initiative by the EU uh, where they encourage, um, or, the, or the, the Raspberry Pi Foundation, where they encourage students to create satellites, CubeSats using Raspberry Pi products. Uh, and and a bunch of them have been launched. There is a marked move from government to commercial activities. Uh, lots of companies coming up, even around UCLA um, in El Segundo, that pretty close by. You can just check them out. And of course, other countries that are not far behind. So countries, so the African Union Space Agency is something that the union kind of came up with. Um, in twenty sixteen or twenty eighteen where they recognize that, hey, there's a huge talent pool across the continent and each country seems to be doing its own thing individually. What if we pull our resources together and, and build one overarching space agency? And then uh, they're based in Egypt, I think, or Cairo. And then we have the Artemis program, which is the, the NASA program uh, in conjunction with its partners from the European Union, Canada, uh, Brazil, I think, uh, the, Japan, your, um, on and across the planet where we, we're going to go back to the moon by 2024 have people up out there and then have a settlement at the very least by the end of the decade and then trends in india and china with india launching um uh, mission to the mars uh, lots of cubesat launches uh a lunar mission last year china with uh lunar missions uh, they have a rover on Mar on the far side of the moon um Lots of lots of rocket launches, and then even a new space, and even stories of a new new space um, station coming up. So the space industry has definitely been heating up over this decade, um, as as you know people have been progressing. And if you're not, and, and we're, and it's basically in, entering uncharted territory at, at this point. Um, and the the it's just really fascinating to see the new startups that are coming up every day. With people realizing that hey, space is not as expensive as it was when I was like a small when I was a small kid. We can actually make you know marked impact on this industry, um, and and make science fiction a reality, which is what got me interested, right? Which got me into brewing space in the first place. Oh, and also I just want to mention one of the missions that the Artemis program is attempting to take is their first. Uh, they're attempting in their first launch to send 13 CubeSats in orbit around the moon. So this is one example where CubeSats and universities come together. Um, yeah. So at this point, if, if you're convinced, do you want to get involved? Um, some ways to do it. Um, some ways to John Bruin space is you can definitely check our website out to learn more about the kind of work we do and, and what goes into learning how to 
you know, make satellites or, or, or how, to, how to get involved in space industry. Um, come join us in building CubeSats. So you can join us, uh, join our Slack here and just, you know, introduce yourself, say hi. You can reach out to me over Slack, uh, ask me questions. One of the guys who asked questions in this chat, I, I would just want to shout out, is Da Cheng Lee. So he's one of the major guys within Burn Space. You can always reach out to him as well. Um, you can join us at this link. Uh, you have to use your UCLA, UC, sorry, UCLA email to sign up. Uh, and if you have any questions about, I don't know, CubeSats or how the space industry is going or rockets or what we're doing at Burn Space, definitely get, send us an email here and, and we'll, we'll, get, we'll try to get back to you. Uh, I also want to introduce like our mascot, um, Brew in Space. Uh, his, his name is Brew, who's in space, kind of get it, like he's in space. Yeah. Oh, thank you, yeah. Um, so this was, uh, we have more stickers of Bruin Space coming up. So you can always come by to our lab, you know, once things open, of course, and, and then just be like, hey, can I have a Bruin Space sticker? And, and can I have a small chat? You can just come by. Uh, I think I forgot to mention here. So we are, we live on Bolter uh, Hall. Okay. So, we live in Boulder Hall, eighth floor, um, right across, right, right opposite the Boulder Hall, um, club, the Boulder Club. Uh, I forgot the name. Uh, you can just check us out. You can take the southwest elevator, come find us there, and, and we're ready to talk to you guys about any topic that you want, uh, and and just to look at the view during you know winters. It's amazing. And I want to end this off by asking you guys, um, what will you dream of? I personally find space exciting. I see the trends exciting and I'm excited to see what you guys can come up with. Um, yeah, so do you guys have any questions for me? You know, post mission analysis kind of thing. Um, stuff that I might have missed or stuff that you want to know more about. You can just ask instead of putting in the chat. Let's check this out. Ah, so we work with uh, uh, people like we we work with people from NASA. Uh, for example, the NASA has the Keep Space Launch Initiative. Uh, rockets as yeah, <laughs> yeah. We use rockets as a service. You want to, you want me to take this one? Sure, go ahead. All right. So with any sort oh, of satellite. Ah, yes. Hello. My name is Ching Li. I am a third year physics major. Uh, I handle communications engineering for what feels like most of the South Campus, as well as um, high altitude uh, engineering over at Room Place. So, on to your question. I don't know how to pronounce your name. Um, so, with any sort of launch, uh, satellite launch that you know, happens in the United States, uh, you have to have a number of, uh, number of legal things taken care of. Uh, communications is one of them, um, which is why it's nice to have uh, experienced communications engineers. Uh, but you also have to have a lot of other things uh, approved by the relevant governmental agencies. But after which, uh, you can, uh, NASA will connect you with a well, a, a company uh, in order to prepare you for launch. Um, Tyvek is one of them. They're good partners with RuneSpace. Um, there are several others, but uh, I'm just going to limit, limit Tyvek. Uh, they prepare you from, uh, they help make the necessary modifications, uh, and they pair you up with a satellite launcher, a service provider. Uh, this could be one of Boeing's uh, new spacecraft. This could be Blue Dawn. This could be well, uh, the Space Launch System or even uh, the SpaceX Falcon X, uh, Falcon 5. Um, and once there, they'll pair you up with, uh, they'll integrate you with a CubeSat launching system. And then uh, 
you'll be ready for mission deployment uh, once you get integrated and you know all sorted out there. So no, that's the that's the bare minute long uh, explanation of how you get a spacecraft ready for launch, and it's pretty universal as far as any of the major uh, uh, manufacturers are concerned. Thank you, Dutching, for answering the question. Any any other takers? You can either post in the chat or you can you know let me know directly. Going once, twice, thrice. Um, well, um, that's about it for me. Thank you guys for um, coming to this passion talk of mine. Um, as you can see, I'm really passionate about CubeSats, about the exciting things that have already been done and the exciting things that are yet to be done um, in the CubeSat industry. And, and yeah, thank you. And it's been fun. So anything from the ACM guys or any questions?